Our next speaker is Pascal Copens, uh, author of the book, The New Normal, How China is Setting the Stage for Innovation. Please join me in welcoming Pascal Copens. Good afternoon. I'm going to talk about China. China's new normal. China's new normal is actually far, far from normal. And I'm going to mention a lot of things about innovation and about technology and disruption. Now, I'm going to start my, my, my story in 1991, long, long time ago. This is me, 1991, traveling through China. I was young, naive, beautiful. Just like the landscape, it was a wonderful experience. This is the moment that I traveled through the whole country, studying Chinese, 30 years ago. I traveled every single train you could go to China. It was a wonderful experience. This is the moment I fell in love with the country. I fell in love with the country, but more so with the people. I fell in love with the Chinese for their energy, their passion, their determination and resilience, their dreams and their hopes. And that today has gotten stronger and stronger 30 years later. And that's the story I want to talk about. Now, 1990, Shanghai looked like this. Who's been to China? Maybe raise your hands. Okay, that's about 30 people. So you know that Shanghai doesn't look like this anymore if you've been there. But back then, Shanghai really was farmland on the other side. Pudong, it's called. And farmers every day were getting the crops out of the ground, bringing them to the city, selling them on the market. Life was beautifully simple. This is Shanghai today. Same spot. Imagine. It's the miracle of China. In 30 years' time, from farmland, this has become one of the most beautiful cities in the whole world. This is all about infrastructure. It's about really the visible things. It's a miracle that we've seen, but for me, this is not an end point because this is about buildings, it's about bricks, it's about lights, it's about things you can see. The next 20, 30 years is all going to be about the invisible. It's going to be about software, about artificial intelligence, about services, about blockchain, about quantum, about lots of things that are going to change every Chinese life to become a better life. And that is the China we should look at. Now, back then, when I was traveling in China, in Shanghai, as a foreigner, as a tourist, you could not stay in any hotel. You had to stay in specific hotels. And these hotels had a sp very specific name. They were called Hotels for Aliens. And so, as an alien myself, I felt instantly at home in my host country, and they treated me ex very, very well at that time. There was even a currency at that moment called the Foreign Exchange Certificate, and this currency was the only currency that foreigners could have. I'm from Belgium, and so I exchanged my Belgian franc at that point with this foreign exchange currency. And we could basically only use it in hotels for aliens and shop for aliens. They were called the friendship stores. And the whole idea was to separate, segregate us from the Chinese population. They were ashamed to show us the poor and backward China. This is 30 years ago. Now, of course, I was young. I wanted to see the world, so I went to the bank. And in the bank, basically, there was always a guy just in front sitting there, standing there, and he only knew one sentence in English. And that sentence was, change money. It's the only thing he knew. Of course, I said, yes, uh, I want to change money because I wanted to buy local stuff in local shops. So we went together into the bank, and I gave my money to the counter, at the counter to the employee. He gave his money, and the employee started counting the money. And in China, the banks were just helping us with the black market to flourish. It was very, very normal. Now, one thing to know about Chinese is that they are very good at counting money extremely good at counting money. I think they're the best at counting money. But also, they're faster than machines. 
general. I think Chinese in general are faster than machines. But there's one thing these employees could not do, and that machines could do, and that was to find fake bills, fake money. Because there was a lot of fake money in circulation at that time. Every bill basically had fake money, and so it was really dangerous. And so these machines could do that, people could not. The other thing, if you look at the biggest bill on top, it's 100 yuan. That's about 10 British pounds at that time. So you have to imagine people having to buy a car, a house, expensive stuff, because they were getting richer and richer. Every day in the bank, you could see people with luggages of money coming in, or bags of money, just to buy the house of their dreams. Very normal. So it was very unsafe. So when mobile payment came along, it's no surprise that every Chinese jumped on that train. Almost half of, the, half of the population in China is using mobile payment. I myself, when I am in Shanghai, I never use cash. And none of my friends in China use cash anymore. There's no need for it. Now, this girl, this little girl, is actually paying with her smartwatch to buy candy as if this is the most normal thing in the world. She's never known cash. Imagine in five years from now, with her parents, she travels to London, has to pay with real cash. It's going to be like visiting the Museum of London. Eh? This is the new normal of China. Now, there's two big systems, and financial, and there's WeBank, and financial is part of Alibaba, and Alipay is a system that we all know out here. Tencent, which is the social media of China, has WeBank with WeChat Pay. These two systems cover 94% of all the payment systems in China. You can pay anywhere. In the most remote village, town, outside, in the country, in the desert, you can still pay with these two systems. There's no need to have anything else. China has become a cashless society. Now, this creates problems, especially for people who need cash, who live from cash. Think about these guys, beggars. Without a QR code, I'm sorry, but they're probably not going to survive the day. And that's literally. How are the poorest of the poor going to get a bank account? How are they going to get a smartphone? to get paid. But even these poor people have adjusted to the new China. Now, if we go back in history, 1990, 70, 754 million people were living below the poverty line, extreme poverty. That's less than $2 a day. Imagine, 754 million people. Today, we're talking about 39 million people. That's 2017. And the president wants to take it all out in two years from now. So China's taken 750 million people out of poverty in 30 years' time. And the growth has been extraordinary. And we all know it. The GDP of China is just extreme what's just happened. But what we don't always realize is that this has created for every Chinese an environment where over the past 30 years, they got a better life. They got richer. And so China in general, everybody got richer. And so when we talk in the West a lot about China not being free as a country, which we totally understand, actually for most people, they've gotten a lot more freedom. And that's a different concept than we realize. This, to me, is the curve of freedom of China. Now, the last years it's going down, and there might be reasons for that. Now, China really woke up in 2008. In 2008, there was the Olympic Games. And at the Olympic Games, China saw the world, and the world saw China with different eyes, the very first time. What happened then was that 3G licenses of telecommunication came along. This was a big change. Because at that point, every Chinese started buying smartphones. Every Chinese. And today, 98% of the internet users in China are using China on their mobile phone. So don't ever build a website for China 
that is not a mobile website. Nobody's going to watch it. China is a mobile-only, mobile-first country. And they're seriously addicted to their phone. I think it's a real problem. It's much, much worse than in the West. Hours and hours every single day. Now, this has a reason. If you think about it, if you've lived in China, if you've been to China, basically there's people everywhere. They, in the dormitories, there's like six or eight students that you have to live with every single day. If you're on the train, there's like a million people every day going to People's Square, the biggest station in Shanghai. Full trains in the lifts everywhere. There's more people than the lift will allow. Of course, most Chinese aren't as big as Americans, for example, so it's okay. But reality is the lifts are full with people. Go to IKEA in Shanghai on a Saturday. I guarantee you, you have more people than products. This is crazy. Now, what is it that we all do when we have a lot of strangers around us, people we don't know? We watch our phone. It's natural behavior. This is not just Chinese. This is not without dangers, of course. So you have to watch. But China would not be China if they wouldn't solve the problems. China's very good at solving problems. So China has built the digital path towards the future. And from now on, we shouldn't worry about digital in China anymore. They're going to lead the way for the rest of the world. That is very, very clear. Now, the company you should all know is Alibaba. And every year on November 11, that's just in two months from now, there is an e-commerce festival like Black Friday called Singles Day. And last year, 2018, Alibaba, on their platform, in 24 hours, sold for 31 billion US dollars of goods. 31 billion US dollars in just 24 hours. And their competitor, JD.com, sold for 23 billion US dollars. Together, 54 billion US dollars. 24 hours. How is that possible? And 90% of it was done through a mobile phone. China is only about mobile payment these days. This is the new normal of China. Now, a bigger, something that impresses me a lot more than that even, is actually delivery. When you sell for $31 billion in goods, that means 600 million packages. I don't know if you've ever seen 600 million packages, but it's a lot of packages. And Alibaba was able to ship this in just one month of time, throughout the whole China, the most remote places. Now, I'm from Belgium, and in Belgium, we have the Belgian Post. We're very proud of it. And in Belgium, the Belgian Post ships about 100 to 200,000 packages a day. It's a lot of packages. If they would have to ship this, in just the small country of Belgium, the last person would have gotten his package after exactly seven years. So it gives you an idea of the scale and the efficiency and the speed of this country. Who's heard of this company, Meituan? Okay, Chinese are not allowed to raise their hands. Okay. So this company, is actually a company that this year, in 2019, by Fortune magazine, which selects every year innovative companies in the world, was selected as the number one most innovative company in the world. Ahead of Apple, ahead of Microsoft, ahead of any company that we would consider innovative. A company we've never heard about. They're the delivery of China, the Uber Eats of China. They have 600,000 employees. The most efficient AI dispatch system you can imagine. They're using drones, they're using robots for delivery. Everything Amazon is talking about, these guys are doing. They're even helping restaurants to get workers and workers to find jobs because they have millions of locations in their platform. A company we've never heard about. And this is what China's all about. They're hiding in secret. They're not telling us that they actually want to become the leader in innovation. In 2013, that's five, six years ago, there was zero unicorns in China. So companies worth $1 billion and still private. Exactly zero, none. 
today we're talking about 149. There's more unicorns in China today than in the America. This has just happened in the last five, six years. So if we want to understand China, we should only look at China since 2013, because that is the moment China completely changed. Now, if you want to build innovative companies like all these guys, and there's hundreds of them, then you need talent. Now, where are you going to find talent in China? Where do you find experts? Where do you find real good people? How about a job fair in Shanghai? I've been there once, one time. I wasn't looking for a job. I thought it would be an interesting place to distribute flyers. But after five minutes, I said, no, I'm, I'm out of here. This is madness. I can't stay here. Every year, 8 million people graduate from university. 8 million people. Now, out of those 8 million people, that's a lot of people, almost 5 million are graduating with a science, engineering, technology degree. 5 million engineers in the world are coming from China. And look at India. Together with India and China, more than half of the populations of STEM graduates come from that one country. So if you ask me, does China really have the capacity to innovate? I mean, the answer is here. Eh? In quantity, you always have quality because you have smart people everywhere in the world. The only difference is China happens to have more of them. It's not their fault. They will innovate or out-innovate many of us. Now, there's a lot of consumers in the world, but China has probably most of them. And all of these consumers, there's 1.4 billion people, they all start having lots of money. And so the middle class in China today is about 300 to 500 million people, depending on the statistics. So you have to imagine half a billion people that actually have a quality of life like we have here in London. This is crazy, but this is the reality of every day. And this is why the finance sector is really looking at China today. But what we should truly look at is purchasing power parity, not just GDP, because GDP of China is still a bit lower than America. It's already as big as the Eurozone. If you look at GDP per capita, it's still one sixth. But once you start looking at purchasing power parity, meaning how much people really can spend on the m and use to have that same quality of life, China's already ahead of the US. And in 2013, I mean, bye-bye America, China is twice as big. This is changing everything. Now, the fintech world has woken up in 2013. And today, the adoption of fintech in the market in China is bigger than anywhere else in the world. And the reason is, of course, the banks and the financial institutions were very traditional, not very service-oriented at the time. And so the data companies said, OK, we're going to take over that for our business. And this slide is pretty hectic. But what you can see is that in China, the big disruptors in the fintech are not the startups or the banks. It's really the data companies, the Alibabas, the Tencents, the Baidus, the JDs, the Pingans, and they are in every vertical you can imagine, not just in one vertical. And this is the strength of Chinese fintech. Now, China wants to become the leader in innovation by 2030. Xi Jinping, President of People's Republic of China, said it very clearly. In 11 years from now, he said that in 2015, so in 15 years from now, Basically, we want to become the leader. And when Chinese say they want to be the leader, I've lived in China more than 20 years, they don't want to come second place, I guarantee you. So they are aimed to become the leader in innovation. And especially in consumer markets, I believe it's happening today. Now, they're going to do that with using technology as a weapon. These four technologies are disruptive technologies. And these technologies are technologies that every Chinese company is now adapting to actually compete with the rest of the world. And my experience is that the big difference between Western companies and Chinese companies that call themselves innovative is that in China, whenever they call themselves innovative, they will put one or multiple of these technologies in front of their name. They'll say, I'm a blockchain bank. I'm an AI automotive company. 
am a robotic shoe manufacturer or an IoT insurance company. And it's like, what are they saying? Well, the reality is they've put their mindset on actually focusing on this one or multiple technologies to make everybody else outcompete them and so make the, make the world better for them. That is the reality. Now, if we look at them, if we start with AI, then basically we have three big companies that are owning a lot of data. Baidu, the Google of China. We have Alibaba, the Amazon, or I would rather call them the eBay of China. And Tencent, the Facebook of China. Although all these three are much better than their originals. But reality is they have more data than Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, any company in the world. And why would I say that? Because like Facebook has 2 billion users. Tencent only has 1.1 billion. How can they have more data? Well, they have more data because they don't only have data from their platform, they have data from all the platforms that they partner with, and especially in the online, and especially through payments. So they know when you go to a restaurant, when you go to a hospital, when you're basically shopping, they know what you do. They got that data, and not just from the payments, also from their partners when its services are used. And so they are the biggest data giants in the world. Now, there's two ways that the future will capture data that China has really advanced on. And one is voice. And if you look at Amazon Echo or you think about Google Home, what you see is that some of us are using it. Usually business people, it's fun. It's, we can ask for some music, the calendar, maybe the weather and some other things. Some of us shop with these voice assistants, but not many people yet. But in China, these voice assistants are getting built into every hardware you can imagine. And by definition, every hardware is built in China. So every hardware is now going to become smart hardware that is going to listen to what you want. And this is very logical. I've learned to write and read Chinese, and it takes a long time. Unfortunately, it took me a long time. It's very cumbersome. Speaking and writing and speaking and listening is very fast. So most Chinese, they're constantly speaking in their WeChat phone because it's more efficient than actually writing and reading. These systems are much more efficient. So if you ever go in Ch to China and you take a lift, all of them are actually in their phone speaking to someone. It's madness to go into a lift. So never go in a lift in China. That's an advice I can give you. Now these devices will all have algorithms inside. And these algorithms will know us better than anybody else. Know us better than our friends, know us better than family, know better than definitely the brands. Because they are listening in. And I know there's a lot of converse controversy. Is it OK that they listen in? But Chinese will give their consent because they usually think that they will get a better service if they agree with it. Now, these algorithms is what we will have to market to in the future. So I believe in 10 years from now, there's not going to be any more marketeers. There's only going to be engineers. Because these engineers will have to figure out how to influence people on the other side of these voice assistants. The other thing is face. If you go in China to any big company, Tencent, Alibaba, IB, uh, Lenovo, or you go into Huawei, you have to scan your face. Otherwise, you don't get into the building. If you go to schools today, and my daughter was in school these days, you actually have to scan your face to get lunch in some schools in China. So if you didn't bring your face today, sorry, no lunch. In China, you can lose your face in many ways. The other thing is any bank, any hospital, the airport, public places, now you have robots. And all these robots have a camera in sight with the intention to have face recognition to give you a butler service. This is very normal. Even a lot of places in the banks, you have now ATMs outside. And these ATMs, you smile and the money's coming out. Life can be simple at times, right? This is not the future, this is today. And if we look at convenience stores, what we see today already is that you can pay in many convenience stores in China just with your face scanning. So forget about mobile payment. Mobile payment is the old world. This is what we're trying to catch up with China. China is already on face payment. In many years, everything's going to be about face payments. And anything you have in your wallet will be replaced with your face 
with my face, with the Chinese face, anybody's face. So anybody in the wallet business is going to go out of business in the next years in China. That's for sure. This is not the future, it's today. Now the other thing is Internet of Things. And to have Internet of Things, you need to connect things. And so you need sensors. And all of these sensors, 90% of all the sensors in the world, are built in Shenzhen, in this one city next to Hong Kong. Everything's built there. And some of these sensors are very, very small. And so these sensors can be built into any device that you can think of. So we talk often about the sharing economy. And we talk about Uber, Airbnb, about bicycle sharing and all these things, steps and so on. In China, these days, you can share everything almost. Mobile phone chargers is the most popular. In every restaurant, you can find it. Umbrellas in every subway station, you can share it. But also luxury goods, fashion art, fashion items. If you want a tennis racket or basketballs, everything gets shared. Because there's mobile payment, and there's actually sensors which are pretty cheap in China. Last year, 60 of the 60 new unicorns were actually created in China. 31 of them were in the sharing economy. And this is the new normal of China. The other thing is 5G. We all know Huawei. Five years ago, I think most of us here we did not know Huawei. Today, everybody knows Huawei because America helped promote this company in some fashion. Now, 5G will become the big thing in Asia. On, November, on October 1st, in just uh, two weeks from now, actually, China is launching this nationally, the whole infrastructure over the whole country. And you can see that we're not going to catch up with Asia when it comes to 5G. So combine 5G, combine IoT, combine AI, and then you have a pretty smart society. Now you just need to automate all that, and that's where robots are used for. Now this is really to save time, to save money, to save energy. That's why we, automate, we do automation. Germany is very, very good at that in factories, but we do it in every, in every industry in itself. Now, in China, robots are getting pretty new normal as well. Five years ago, only 50 robots for every 10,000 users, or 10,000 employees, sorry. Today, we're talking about 150 robots for every 10,000 employees. The standard in the West for developed countries is 167. So China's almost there. Next year, they've beaten any country in the West in terms of automation of factories. So forget about the old China where everybody's copycatting with low labor and basically no robots. This is the new China. And they're not concerned as much about jobs as we are because if you have to deliver 600 million packages, it's not a discussion item. Either you do it with robots or you don't deliver the packages. And so in China, right now, they're solving the problem to improve society and the jobs they'll figure it out. Or they'll all give them to Meituan, who actually has a need of more people with scooters. So this is the reality. Now, our sensors in our body are not going to be able to cope with the sensors outside. Everything that is running outside in this world is going to go so fast, we will not be able to understand what is going on around us. This is going to become our new normal. And if anybody is not worried about this now, then there's something wrong with you. Now this is going to be reality. We're going to live in a video game. And Chinese will be very used to start living in a video game. They're also the most crazy video gamers in the world. The biggest video company in the world is called Tencent. And so, yes, they are up for it. This guy is the former CEO of Google in China. It's called Li Kaifu. He's actually saying that China is leading the way to become an homo sapiens society. We just heard from the previous speaker that we're all homo sapiens. Well, that's the past. Today, we're all going to move and become homo sapiens without the H. What it means, online merge with offline. It means that we won't see a difference anymore between the real world and the virtual world, between analog and digital. Because in any world that you exist, the other world can creep in without you even noticing, and it's going to be very, very normal. This is China's new normal. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is trust. And the question is, can we still trust companies? Can we trust Mark? I don't know. Can we trust our companies? Well, Alibaba, Jack Ma said, if you don't have trust, 
you will never be able to do e-commerce. And he said that in 2004. So for China, trust is everything. Now, there's technologies they use. One is artificial uh, augmented reality, because a lot of problems in China. China is a very low trust society. It means if you're not a friend, there's really almost distrust. When you're a good friend, blind trust. But it's a very different society. So there's a lot of scams, a lot of fake goods, a lot of things that shouldn't happen, scandals like vaccines and, and melanin and all these things. So China needs to understand what transparency is about. And so they're creating apps to show you what's behind the scene. Another thing they're doing is put everything on virtual reality these days. Now, VR is getting really big in China. And this is a big theme park in Nanning in the south of China. And it's a theme park with billions and billions of dollars of investment. It's the most expensive VR experience center you can imagine, somewhere in China, in the middle of China. Now, it's expensive to buy a ticket there. So some people don't have that money. And so they go to the local shop that gives them the same VR experience. So you see, in China, even when you have no money, there's always a solution. And people will always help you to create an experience that is fantastic. So I welcome you to come to China one day and experience it as well. Now, this guy is a professor who gave an explanation just recently on blockchain and Bitcoin, because that is the big thing that is changing in China. I don't have time to explain everything what's happening, but reality is it's starting to really take off in China. He's explaining it very simple. So if you follow, you will understand now what Bitcoin and blockchain is all about. So just follow carefully. Bitcoin is really about cryptocurrency, and China has been against it for a long time because they couldn't control everything that was going on. Now they're launching their own digital currency in probably a month or two from now, and this is going to change the world. When it comes to blockchain, the problem is it's the only way to make sure that everything we don't trust is actually becoming trustworthy. And so blockchain is in every supply chain and quality of goods and everything, and so in China, there's a saying that there's only three places where blockchain experts are really taking serious. It's in Silicon Valley, it's in Beijing, and in Shenzhen. These are the three places where all the blockchain experts are trying to, be, to implement it in society. So you all understood it now? Good. I can move on. The last thing I want to say is about ecosystems, and then I'll wrap up, because this is very important. McKinsey predicts that by 2025, 30% of all the revenue in the world will be linked to an ecosystem. 30%. So if you're not part of an ecosystem, you're probably going to lose 30% of your revenue in the next five, six years to come. Be prepared. Be warned. In China, all of these unicorns here on the right are actually being invested by the big companies. The Alibabas, the Tencents, the Baidus, the JDs. If you are not invested by a big ecosystem, basically it's almost impossible to grow your company in that digital data economy. Now, Alibaba has a lot of products, and all of these products are built in one big platform where you can go from one to another without even having to log off many of the times. The data gets just swapped. If you look at the, the West, we have to go from one application to the other, log in again, and basically be a different person and a different identity on all of these, these places. Now, a little video from Jack Ma to explain the difference between him or Alibaba and Amazon to make sure to understand or to explain what ecosystems is all about. Right. The difference between Amazon and us. Amazon is more like an empire. Everything they should control themselves, buy and sell. And our philosophy is that we want to be an ecosystem. Our philosophy is to empower others to sell, empower others to, to service, empower, make sure the other people are more powerful than us. Making sure with our technology, our innovation, our partners, our 10 million small business sellers, they can compete with Microsoft, IBM. Our philosophy is that we, we think using internet technology, we can make every company become Amazon. So it's quite easy, right? If you want to beat your competitor, you want to beat Amazon, just make all your partners as big as Amazon. Of course, it's not as simple as that. But reality is that he understood that if you enrich your clients, your partners, they will become bigger, you will become bigger as well. And we in the West, very few of us, 
think about making our customers richer. Maybe we do in the finance world, but in many industries we don't, because we want to actually become richer ourselves. Now, a good example, and this is the last example I want to show, is actually about a company called Zhong An. I don't think there's many people who know this company, but this company is an online, a digital online insurance company in China. They've been launched, they launched their company just four or five years ago, less than five years ago. Zhong An was invested by these three guys in the middle. You recognize Jack Ma. On the left, that's Pony Ma, the founder of Tencent, so the Facebook of China, and Ma Ming Zhe in the middle, who is the founder of Ping An, the biggest insurance company in the world with more than a million employees. These three guys, these three companies, all three of them, are the fiercest competitors in China. They all have insurance products. Now you have to explain me why would these three companies, these three founders, invest money in a startup that nobody's ever heard about in insurance. It's because of the ecosystem. It's all because if somebody can tap into all these ecosystems, the ecosystem becomes bigger. And when the ecosystem becomes bigger, actually there's an opportunity for these companies to become bigger as well. This company, Zhongan, is four years old. They now sold for 10 billion insurance policies already. It's not a bad startup, isn't it? Now, they have a product where they put on the ankle of every chicken a tracer. Why would an insurance company put tracers on chicken in China? And there's a lot of chickens in China, I can tell you. Why would they do that? It makes no sense. Well, because eating chickens is important and they want to make sure that the health of people is, is good, so they want to make sure that when they insure later on, the health stays okay. Now, if you buy one of these chickens in the shop, in, this, in, the, in the market, basically you can scan a QR code and you will know exactly how many steps the chicken made. Because a chicken that made more steps is more healthy than a chicken that made less steps. And so you can assume you're getting a healthy chicken, which means you will be more healthy. On top of it, they added blockchain on it to make sure that you got the right chicken as well. This is a combination of technology in an industry that an insurance company in the West would never think of doing. And this is about my story about ecosystems. We don't have to look at the industry. We have to look at what our users want. And this is exactly what China's doing. Now, of course, we could put this to, to work in other places. How about to people? And we could put a tracer on every person. We call that the social credit score these days in China. I'm sure you heard about it in the media. They can't stop talking about it. There's a lot of misconceptions about it, so I want to mention that as well. One thing is that it's, there's a financial part, and that financial part means it's like a credit history in the US or the National Bank in Europe. They will tell you whether you're credit worthy or not. That is a score, just like with us. And then the other one is a moral score, but that is actually a blacklist. It's not a scoring system. And so you're either on the blacklist or you're not on the blacklist. And that's mainly for tax evasions and for criminals. Of course, what China does very well is they say, okay, we're gonna build a new system, so every city in China can try out things. And so everybody's doing crazy things, and these all get into the media, and suddenly it's Big Brother, and it's 1984 all back. I'm not sure this is all gonna happen, but one thing is sure, is that China is trying to build the most trustworthy society on this planet, especially because there's a very low trust into the society. They need to do it. They don't have something, a system like credit history in China. So the intriguing part for me is that the more China wants to build a trustworthy society, the less the West trusts China. And if we want to learn from the innovators of tomorrow, from the innovators from China, but we don't trust China, how can we learn from companies like Zhongan and Alibaba and Tencent who are really leading the way in the transformation? This is the paradox that we will have to live with in the next years. And we will have to decide, are we going to work with China or not? Are we going to be part of an ecosystem or not? But one thing to know, if we're going to decide not to be part of an ecosystem, then we will have a challenge because our customers, our clients, are going to trust the ecosystem more than the brands in the future. And with this, 
I hope that I've given you some inspiration, some ideas about China. Trust it as much as you can to start with, at least to learn from it. You don't need to do business with it, but at least to learn from it. And it's going extremely fast. So for everyone who didn't raise their hand in the beginning, buy that ticket to China, to Shanghai, to Shenzhen. Go there and explore these innovators. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pascal, for that fascinating view of China. Um, and I think, you know, there's no question about it. The, the takeaway message here is that we should all be worried, very worried, about trying to catch up with the new China. You emphasized ecosystems. And I think that is a really important takeaway for the audience here that the new thinking is not about how do I crush the other guy, but how are we stronger together? Because together we will have a network effect that benefits everyone. And so, you know, yes, I mean, we can all learn lessons from the big Chinese internet giants like Tencent, Badu, Alibaba, they've all managed to move into different verticals just like Amazon has done in the United States. But it's very hard to say to a bank or an insurance company, oh yeah, just be like Badu, be like Apple, right? I mean, they've got legacy systems, they have a hierarchical management system, they have a way of doing business and it's very, very difficult to change. But where I think there is an opportunity, and you touched on this very well in your talk, is to look at an example of Ping An, a Chinese traditional insurance company that has taken the lessons of Alibaba and created a way of using a platform economy to branch into a whole lot of new verticals mm -hmm. and create the, this network effect. In fact, I think they've launched something like six unicorns on their own just in the yep. last couple of yep. years. Yep. Sure. So what, what can the people in this room learn from that? Well, a, a company like Ping An, which is, uh, used to be the, the f one of the first insurance companies in China. They're from 88, I think it is, so a long time ago. They then quickly moved into finance, but after some time, and that's not so long ago, just like I would say five, six years ago, they decided to completely reinvent themselves. And they understood that they would have to do a number of things. And, and most of these big ecosystems today, they've started doing the same number of things. And I think whether you're a bank or an insurance company, it doesn't matter if you just somehow follow that, there's an opportunity to do it. And one is indeed uh, ecosystems. So Ping An decided to build their own ecosystem. For those who aren't big enough, they actually jump on somebody else's ecosystem. And you've seen, you see examples of companies that have started with an ecosystem and that now have outgrown that ecosystem that they belong to and became their own ecosystem, like Didi, which is the Uber of China. They, they, they are now their own ecosystem. And so that's one of the things. And so this is really about um, trusting the partners uh, to actually invest in startups. The big challenge I see when I came back to Belgium, to Europe, in three years ago, it is really that uh, corporations, large co corporations, don't trust startups will survive and don't understand the culture of these bigger companies. On the other hand, the startups feel that they're going to get controlled by these big guys. And so there's a lot of worry on both sides. In China, you see much more that companies see, if we don't work together with the big companies, we're not going to survive anyway, so we better do it. And the big companies said, well, we don't have the bandwidth to do all that innovation, and we want to be in every industry, so we're going to work with all these startups. And like Ping An, then they create six unicorns in just five, six years' times. But they've done that by spinning out the new businesses, right? And, yes. also, and partnering and yep. acquiring. So I think that's, that's part of the lesson here. Yeah, so it's well. not about acquiring and keeping with yourself. They're actually investing in these companies, and they have a vested interest. And I think having a vested interest makes you think different as well. Now you also, near the end of your talk, you talked about the danger of not trusting China um, or not working with them. Let's talk about how quickly 
uh, China is um, developing artificial intelligence. Now, they are doing it in a different way than in the US or maybe the way that we would do it in Europe, but um, they're, they're really um, gaining traction in a number of areas like uh, autonomous cars mm -hmm. and, um, and some Western companies are starting to, 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 to work with them. Yes. Um, what, what advice would you have for, for people in the room? Well, <clears throat> I think China, five years ago, four or five years ago, figured out that um, when it comes to innovation, I mean, the West is probably better in many things, uh, in manufacturing and in, in, in lots of industry like finance. They're not going to be able to beat or compete with the West anytime soon. Because these resources that the West has is built on decades of experience and smart people. And so they said, what is it that we can do to actually counter that? And that's where data comes in because China has a lot of data. And they, the other thing they do much faster than we do as well is share that data within that ecosystem. Uh, we are kind of worried about sharing still, and, but we will have no option. But China figured out if we actually use that data, every business model in the world in every industry will be rewritten with AI. So there's no industry that is not gonna be victim to AI in one fashion or another. So we can win as China, we can win actually in this industry. Look at self-driving cars. I mean, we will never become the BMW, Mercedes, or whatever it is, but what we can become is the next self-driving car because then everything is being built from scratch again. And so they figured out that if they use this well, this resource, that's their gold mine to compete with the rest of the world. And so unless we find that same gold mine, they might overtake us pretty quickly. But can't, we, can't the West fight back by if traditional industries would get together in industry consortiums, create platforms of their own, they could have the volume of data and quality of data and industry knowledge, deep industry knowledge, uh, to, yep. to um, you know, at least have sure. a, a good chance of fighting back. But sure. it requires a mindset shift mm. of being willing to share information with your competitors in order to, uh, yep. to get ahead. No, that, that's very true. And, and even in China, you see that the banks are working very close with the data companies uh, because it's a mutual dependency there as well. Because the banks have the ear of the government and they have the regulation and they have experience in different areas than the data companies have. And so, yes, they work very closely together as well. And in some cases, these bank has actually employed many more people since the digital revolution. Well, here in Europe, we see a lot of layoffs because of this digital transformation. I mean, in Belgium, at least, I see it. And I, I think another important point here is that only just a couple of years ago, China was nowhere on AI. I mean, really nowhere. Um, and so I think the lesson for traditional companies is, you know, you, you can catch up if you have the determination and you put the resources and the, and the people power behind it, sure. it's possible to, um, to become innovative within a very short period of time. Yes. But we don't have a lot of time, right? Because China is moving, as you said, super fast. Yes. So um, the, the message, particularly I think for Europe is, you know, we, we, we need to move at, at the pace of uh, China. Yes. No, very much, very much, very agree. And, and I, I do believe this miracle of AI is only three years old, like you just said. Yeah. So we can build our own miracle. We just want to have to do it. Okay. Well, um, on that note, let me mention that there is a, another session on China going on or just about to start now in the Discover Zone. Um, so I would urge you to go there if you're interested in hearing more. Please come back here at 4.30. We're going to have curated networking, and you'll also have a chance to talk with Pascal and have uh, a, a book, uh, get a copy of his book and have him sign it. So see you back here at 4.30, and thank you all very much.